can you do work on a rotating object? Does it take work, like for example when they change, uh, when they balance your tires, they, they put it on this machine and it spins the tire, does that motor that spins up your tire do uh, some actual work? And the answer is yes, as you might have uh, guessed. In the same kind of way that you can do, uh, different, but, same, uh, but work is the same principle, that if you push on something and it moves, then you can do work on it. So here's, the, here's how, to, how to think about doing work on a rotating object. Let's suppose that you have a rope, you're pulling on this wheel, and you're causing that wheel to spin. Now, the, the object isn't moving, and so the F, S, cosine, theta for the definition of work isn't really going to work here because it's, it's not actually translating. The center of mass isn't moving. But nevertheless, it is going a certain distance. So um, if you use the formula for work, F, S, cosine, theta, and you say that the displacement is in the same direction as the force, then the angle between the force and the displacement is going to be zero. Cosine of zero is one. And, and that's true at every instant as you, as you move, move this along. The displacement of this portion of the wheel is always going to be in the same direction as the force. But s equals r theta, that's the arc length formula. So if you lay down a distance s here, a certain arc length, we can relate that to the radius of the circle and the angle. I forget which concept that is, but it's a concept that we've talked about. s equals r theta, plug that into here, you got an r theta here. And then you recognize that this portion of it, f times r, force, times this distance, this radius here becomes the lever arm for this force because here's the axis of rotation, here's the line of action of the force, and the distance between that point, the axis of rotation, and this line of action is the radius. So that's a torque. So we can replace FR by the torque, and the work therefore is the torque multiplied by the angle through which you, that force has caused the object to rotate, or that torque has caused the object to rotate. Um, so the work done is the torque times the angular displacement. Um, And we, we actually use theta here, and the book uses uh, theta. In the past, uh, we've talked about an angular displacement and, and denoted it by delta theta. In this case, we're just using theta, but here theta really is the angular displacement. How much the angle has changed during the application of that force. Um, And so here it is in a concept. The rotational work, we put this R here to remind us that it's rotational work rather than translational work. And it's equal to the torque applied, in, measured in Newton meters, um, times the angle uh, in measured in radians. And this is another formula. Remember, S equals R theta only applies if the angle is measured in radians. Same thing here. That angle's got to be in radians. And that's uh, rotational work done. Well, we, we talked already about the fact that th there is something called the work energy, sorry for walking off screen, it's the work energy theorem. And it says that the work done by the net force is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. Well, uh, when you rotate something, uh, is there kinetic energy associated with that rotation? And the answer is yes. And you can actually think about this as a bunch of little individual masses, mass m1, here this little blue dot there, mass m2. Add up all the little masses and, and ask about what the kinetic energy, one half mv v squared is for each piece. Add all those up and um, that gives you, 
what's known as the rotational kinetic energy. And when you do the derivation, there's a discussion about it in the book, or we could go uh, through it in a little bit more detail. But the bottom line is that if you have a, an object with a moment of inertia I, that all these details with the small little masses and stuff get, get stuffed into, into I. So if you know if it's a disk, the moment of inertia is one half m r squared, for example. And that the uh, rotational kinetic energy is proportional to, or is equal to one half times i times omega squared. How do you know it's omega squared? Well, it looks the translational kinetic energy is one half m v squared, and v is r omega. So you know that you're going to end up, when you square v, you're going to square omega. So you know you'll need an omega squared here. And these, this r squared and the m's will actually be involved in, in creating the, the moment of inertia. So that's a rotational kinetic energy. So the total kinetic energy is the translational kinetic energy plus the rotational kinetic energy if it's rotating. So this allows us to do conservation of energy, including rotations. And one of the classic examples of this is an example that we've already looked at. It's the, the demo where we took a disk, a solid disk, and a hoop, and we released them from rest, let them slide, go down the uh, the inclined plane and ask which one wins. So our approach earlier is going to be different from our approach now. We're going to approach this exact same problem using conservation of energy. So here's our solid disk or our solid cylinder, and here's our hollow cylinder, a ring or a hoop. Um, and as we saw in the demo video, the solid disk wins, and the hoop loses. It lags behind. You can see that using conservation of energy. Let's actually just do the problem. The total energy now, if we can ignore the work done by non-conservative forces, will be the kinetic energy, which can, is the both translational energy, one half mv squared, plus one-half i omega squared, the rotational kinetic energy, plus gravitational potential energy. So this is kinetic plus potential. Here's our initial situation. Here's our final situation. And we're going we're gonna to ask what the um, final velocity of each of these objects is when it reaches the end of the ramp. Now, the solid cylinder has, is reaching the end of the ramp right now. Shown in this picture, the hoop has not yet reached the end of the ramp, but the calculation is to figure out how fast it's going when it reaches the end of the ramp. So uh, initially, we're going to release these from rest, both released from rest. So the initial velocity, initial speed is zero. Also, oh, that's final. Sorry about that. This one's OK. Here's the initial, the initial velocity. That is, that is zero. Actually, we have a real cool mechanism here. All right, so that one's still rocking and rolling. The initial velocity is zero. What's the initial angular velocity, omega i? Well, if you remember, an object that's rolling without slipping has uh, its velocity of its center of mass, its translational uh, velocity of the center of mass equals its radius times its angular velocity. Up here, the translational velocity v is 0, and r isn't 0. Therefore, omega has to be 0. And that makes sense, because you start it from rest. It's not 
it's not moving and it's not rotating either. So the initial uh, rotational kinetic energy is zero. But we do have some initial um, height. This we call, uh, this HI is H naught, according to the diagram. That's the initial height of the two uh, objects. Now finally, we're going to have uh, both translational kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy when it gets to the bottom here, but the final gravitational potential energy will be zero. Why? Because the final height, the initial height is H naught and the final height is zero. So that's why that term disappears. So now, uh, the terms that are left over are the, the two, kinetic two final kinetic energies and the initial gravitational potential energy. Then, as we've uh, talked about before, well, as we talked about right here, we can actually solve this equation for omega and apply it to the final event. Omega final is uh, V final over R. That's this equation right here. I'm going to plug that into here. And as you can see, 1 half MB squared comes along for the ride. 1 half I V final squared over R squared, when I plug this equation in, equals MG HI. Replace HI with H naught. We solve this equation for V final. And let's actually, um, let's work that through in our heads. What we'll do is we'll factor out a 1 half and a V final squared. Actually, let me do this step. Um, let me write out this step. 1 half V final squared. What's left over? We've got M from this term that's left over. And then we have I. over r squared left over from this term when I factor out the 1 half v final squared. And that's equal to mgh naught. So now this final step to solve for the uh, final velocity, the way that I'll do that is multiply both sides of this equation by 2. So that'll bring the 2 over to the numerator here. And divide both sides of the equation by this gobbledygook inside of the parentheses. That's m plus i over r squared. And since I want v final instead of v final squared, I'm going to take the square root of both sides. That gives this equation. OK, what does this equation tell us? First of all, uh, to figure out what it's going to tell us about this race, we have to remind ourselves what the moment of inertia of these two objects is. This one's m r squared for the hoop. And this one, for the solid cylinder, is 1 half mr squared. So v final for the hoop. What's it going to be? Here's the moment of inertia for the hoop. That's OOP. It's MR squared. I'm going to put that right in here. MR squared here, the R squareds cancel, and we get an M plus an M is a 2M. And amazingly enough, there's a 2M in the numerator, and those cancel. And so the final velocity for the hoop is the square root of GH naught. Very cute. For the disk, the final velocity, we're going to have to put this moment of inertia in for the disk. 1 half mr squared, and we're going to put that into this equation. What do we get? 1 half mr squared divided by r squared is just 1 half m for this bottom term here, plus m m plus 1 half m is 3 halves m. But the m's cancel. 
So we have 2 divided by 3 halves. That's the same as 2 times 2 divided by 3. That's 4 thirds. So the disk, which one has the highest velocity at the end of the day? Amazingly, the radius and the mass of the disk both canceled out of this calculation. It's such a cool thing. The only thing that this calculation cares about is whether it's a hoop or a disk and how high they were released from and what the acceleration of gravity is. Well, which one has the greater velocity when it reaches the bottom? Well, the square root of 4 thirds, well, 4 thirds is bigger than 1, so the square root of 4 thirds is also bigger than 1. So this disk is going to have a higher velocity when it gets to the bottom than the hoop does. And that's just another um, confirmation of the, of the demo that we did and the earlier calculations that we did on this, that at, when they reach the bottom, the disk is going to have the highest velocity. That means it got there faster. It's starting from zero, it gets to a faster velocity, it gets there faster than the, um, than the, the hoop does. So the, the, the solid disk wins the race.